I'm Bruce Shapiro. I'm executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. Um, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the DART Center, on behalf of the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University to tonight's event, which carries the title, more or less, Scar Tissue, One Crime, Two Writers, 18 Years. Uh, it's a conversation between uh, myself, my friend Emily Bernard, and Nicholas Lemon, who's the dean of the School of Journalism. Um, I'm glad you're all here. It's an important event for all of us here. Before we begin, uh, I just have a few announcements to make. First of all, on the back table, along with the food, you will find um, some background on the DART Center. Um, the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, for those of you who are new friends of ours, uh, provides training and support uh, to journalists who cover violence, conflict, and tragedy of all kinds. Everything from family violence and street crime up to war and international human rights. We're based here at Columbia. We work around the world um, dealing both with how the most difficult stories get told by journalists, the craft of telling stories about trauma, and the impact of that work on journalists and how those of us who do this job can stay resilient in the face of enormous challenges. Um, on the back table, besides additional background, you will find Dart Center stress balls, which you are free to take. Um, Nick told me a few minutes ago that he views this as the best journalism school swag ever, which I take as a huge compliment. Um, also on the back table, at, at, at this time in events, so this hold up Dart Center contribution cards and say, please help us if you like this event. I'm happy if you do that, but far more important, um, we're here still in the shadow of Storm Sandy. Many of our friends and neighbors and indeed some people in this room are dealing with the consequences of, of the worst natural disaster in New York City history. Um, we have these sheets on your chairs which are um, an opportunity to contribute to the mayor's uh, fund for New York City hurricane relief. Um, this is not an actual pledge card. Uh, you have to go to the website, the URL, which is uh, listed on this sheet. It's listed on the bottom. But I encourage you to take a look at it. When you get a chance, go to a computer and please support the mayor's uh, hurricane uh, relief fund, which is supporting a wide range of programs and activities helping out our neighbors at this very difficult time. Uh, also on the back table, you will find several copies of Carl Van Vechten and the Harlem Renaissance, the most recent book by Emily Bernard. Um, there are several copies. You are free to buy them. We encourage you to buy them and support the work of scholarship and the work of writing that this represents. Um, I'm going to get out of the way, and or at least get a little bit out of the way and let Nick take it from here. Um, Nick, all yours. OK. Um, this is on. Welcome, everybody, again. Um, I'm not going to operate from the podium, if that's OK. Uh, we're a fairly intimate group. And um, I'll be in kind of a standard moderator mode for the first period of this. But I hope that, that before too long, we can go uh, interactive and start um, you all can start engaging with uh, our speakers. Um, so um, as you probably know, but I'll just repeat, um, this uh, event is a, at least at its beginning, a discussion of a specific event uh, that both of our panelists um, participated in, if that's the right word, um, and both of them later at very different times and in very different ways wrote uh, memorable essays about. Um, so let's just start by establishing uh, as our baseline uh, what happened on August 7th, 1994. Um, Emily, why don't you start? Um, I think in some ways it's more of a question uh, that Bruce and I have addressed in our essays. It's hard to say exactly what happened, but I guess the bare bones, uh, a man named Daniel Silva entered a coffee shop in New Haven called Coffee. And he um, was, I saw signs of distress as soon as he came in the building. There's something off about this guy. 
And as the coffee shop was closing, he pulled out a knife and he started to stab people. Um, and he managed to stab seven of us uh, as we were all trying to get out of the, get out of the place. Um, he's recently been uh, set free yeah. and has you know, become someone who now is capable of sort of apologizing. He was suffering from mental illness. He was paranoid, schizophrenic. Um, and along the way, we have uh, kind of experienced different, uh, different kinds of processes of, re of recovery. And that's, I think, what Bruce and I, why we began writing these essays, to address the question of recovery and the relation of recovery to, to narration. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for my experience of this event matches Emily's. I had gone out that night with um, some friends, uh, sitting, had, had dinner at a nice little restaurant on the shoreline and was sitting in this coffee shop at closing time when this guy I had never seen before pulled out a knife and started, just started stabbing people, seven people all together, including the two friends I was with and including me. Um, Everyone survived, I guess I should say that. Um, nearly everyone required extensive hospitalization, including both of us. Uh, our assailant, Mr. Silva, was caught minutes later um, and went through a lengthy judicial process uh, and civil commitment process. Um, and yeah, we each took different paths to writing about it. In my case, very shortly after, a few months afterwards, and in Emily's case, many years after. That's, that's the terrain we're on tonight. Um, at the risk of uh, um, getting into uncomfortable territory, but I, I think it's uh, fair since you both did write about it, uh, could each of you talk about literally what does it feel like to be stabbed and uh, where did you get stabbed and what were the next, say, two or three hours of your life like in, in some detail, if, if you don't mind? Um, my memory is so different, uh, different from Bruce's because I didn't start to remember to write about this for many years. So I don't remember the pain at all. I remember the surprise. You know, I didn't expect to go out and be stabbed that night. So there was a lot of just, uh, I experienced psychologically a feeling of just being stunned. Um, something I always say is that it didn't hurt in the way that um, I think that, you know, everyday kinds of traumas we go through physically hurt. I mean, it was more that, you know, my body, I think, experienced a kind of surprise, too. It was just something, it was hard to assimilate into my experience of the world. Um, it, it was, it, the impact was, uh, you know, strong enough to knock me down. Um, and I didn't realize I was bleeding uh, profusely until, you know, I was sitting, waiting for what? You know, an ambulance um, on some steps around the corner. And I saw the blood before I really felt the, you know, felt pain, you know, it was that I saw it first and then somehow I was able to, you know, kind of come to some understanding that I was actually in pain, but it was, I felt such a distance from the experience and I think it's very classic experience of trauma. Um, and the next two or three hours were, were really, um, I, was, I just sort of was in a state of shock, not only I think physically, but, um, but psychologically. And the experience, there was so much adrenaline kind of racing through my body that, um, I didn't, I didn't experience real pain until much later. But of course, you know, I was on, I was on a gurney and there was so much chaos that it was really, um, I was really sort of uh, um, so separate from what was going on. I was just observing it and experiencing it on a very, very different level um, than, than, I guess, uh, sensation. It was something else. Um, and immediately, you know, we went into surgery, and so there's a lot of fear. You know, as soon as I really understood that how, how dangerous my situation was, and I saw the anesthesiologist come in, and just a look on his face was terrifying to me. And I knew that, you know, uh, there's a chance that, you know, this was not going to end well. Um, and so I guess I'll leave it to Bruce now. Can, can just one other question, which since you talk about it in the, in the essay you wrote is, a little bit about the nature of your interaction with the medical system in those first few hours and, and um, positive experiences, negative okay. experiences. Well, you know, I had a sur uh, the surgeon who operated on me, um, you know, I was waiting for him to, to come up and I was, you know, at that point I really was experiencing terror as I, you know, 
was waiting to go into surgery. I'd never had surgery before. And he walked up to me and he just plunged his fingers into my wound um, to gauge how deep it was because you know the sac and that protects your stomach has been penetrated, it's very dangerous. And so he did that and I instinctively grabbed his arm and his response was to say very coldly, don't grab my arm. And so that was just another layer of terror. I mean, who is this person who was gonna now operate on me? Um, and the nurses you know, looked at me with real sympathy, or it's what I remember. They were, I think, really shocked by his, own, his behavior. Um, so I felt completely powerless and helpless uh, at his hand. You know, I obviously depended upon him. And it was the nurses that, who were you know, the most compassionate. I mean, I think maybe that's just a, that's a cliche. But, um, and I also had an EMT uh, who was uh, there when I was sitting on the steps kind of with the crowd of people or with another person who survived the incident. And he and I, uh, it was the strangest thing, but because I, I, I wasn't really, I was um, determined not to admit to myself yeah. that I had been stabbed. I was sitting on these steps <laughs> pretending that I wasn't and you know, kind of counseling him on how to manage the person next to me who was, and then he saw the blood over my wound and I started to go into shock and he, you know, we just started to laugh because it was so re absurd what was happening. And then my wound would gape open and he, we would both start laughing again. Um, and I think, I mean, he came to see me in the hospital later and I think he felt, um, you know, kind of um, a little embarrassed about that <laughs> moment. But it wasn't at all, it was a kind of bonding moment for us, I think, and I think because he saw not only my, my humanity, but a little corner of my personality, and we, we kind of recognized each other yeah. on that level. Um, that's a, actually a positive memory I have from the experience. But the experience with the physician uh, was, was probably more, was definitely more traumatic to me, for me, than the actual stabbing. And my husband remembers, well, I was in the hospital pretty recently uh, in 2008. Um, he, I was very aggressive with the surgeon because I was re-experiencing, you know, that, but he was a wonderful and gentle man, this third surgeon that I had. Right. Um, but my husband saw it, you know, I, myself, I was, when I was getting ready to go on the table again, I was, um, you know, kind of lodged in fear, but, so it was that original experience with that first surgeon was made a deep and unhappy impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my case, it, it's interesting because there's some parallels and some things that are very different. Um, like you, pain was not an immediate mm -hmm. feature. I, I to Nick, I mean, your question was what did it feel like? At the time, the way I described it to people and so the way I've kind of described it to myself was that it felt like being punched in the back. I was mm -hmm. going out the door of this coffee shop. It was as if a sudden chaotic event had happened and you all kind of flee for the exits and I was with a friend, one of my friends on uh, trying to get out the door and I, I felt this punch in my back and then ended up on the ground um, with this guy who had a beard having already stabbed me in the back though I didn't realize that's what it was at the time standing over me and with a knife in my chest and um, at in those moments I too didn't feel any physical pain. I did I did become aware of sort of tissue parting, muscles kind of not doing what they're supposed to do and it, it not feeling right. Um, it took uh, time I'm not so sure about, it took a little while before, by the time the ambulance got there, I was, my adrenaline was pumping and it did hurt like hell in a kind of burning way back here. I also had no idea that I was mm -hmm. quite badly injured and in fact, um, both with Daniel Silva, our assailant, uh, whose name I didn't know at that time, and with the EMTs, I was actually kind of functioning a little bit as a journalist. I kept interviewing them. I, I, I said to Silva, why are you doing this? Uh, I said to the EMTs, what are you doing next? Tell me what you're going to do next. I mean, I really kept trying to get little bits of information to keep in control of the event. It was very much like that. Um, I. My memories of my initial encounters with, with the docs and nurses were mostly good. I actually don't remember much about doctors before going into surgery. I do remember very well getting to Yale New Haven Hospital, which was five minutes away, and being totally amped on, on adrenaline, and um, clothes being cut off, and a nurse saying to me, we're going to take care of you now. And 
didn't particularly register that at the moment at that moment but months later when any of you remember the TV show ER it was a you know, big deal TV show at the time if you watch it one of the things they routinely write into the script is nurses saying to people when they come in okay we're gonna take care of you now you don't even hear it uh, I heard it in a totally new way. I wept every time I heard that on ER it was a very strange experience um, but there was I, I don't remember fear of surgery. I do remember a lot of discomfort around sort of the anesthesia and the prep and stuff like that. And then waking up in enormous pain. I do remember that. Less than a year afterward, uh, you wrote about it. Yeah. Um, why did you decide to write about it? It, it was an interesting thing because I hadn't intended to. I, I very uh, at the time, I was a writer and editor for The Nation, working for Victor, who's in the back of the room, and for Katrina Van Den Heuvel. And um, I thought of this as a private experience. But at the time that this happened, I also had been writing a lot about criminal justice. Um, and first of all, was in the strange experience of uh, having been a reporter for many years, now suddenly being on the other side of the story. I have had a bunch of encounters with journalists, some of them good, some of them bad. But also, um, and this kind of comes full circle to this moment, it was a, literally the yesterday's election and a referendum in California over three strikes and all kinds of things. Um, I had been covering the steady toughening of criminal justice laws, and in particular, a big crime bill that passed Congress in 1994. And I had this massive realization that, that, that the debate that I had been covering was completely irrelevant to my own safety and to the situation of Emily, who by then I had gotten to know, and my other friends. Um, and it, it kind of jangled. And the particular precipitating incident with, with which I opened this essay um, back in 1995 was uh, being at home while I was still recovering and um, turning on the local news and there was a story about an equivalent of the three strikes law being up in the Connecticut legislature and uh, they needed what in the news business you call B-roll, some stock footage to illustrate it. Stock footage they used was an image of me being put into the ambulance that night, um, which had been filmed. I'd seen it before, but in the context of news stories about the stabbing. Um, I went crazy, and I started to throw stuff at the television set, and and that was the immediate precipitating incident. But it was I, I wrote it really because of a sense of this very private and personal series of events taking on new political <coughs> resonance at a time when crime and safety were at the center of, of the political agenda, at a time when um, the responsibilities of citizens to one another were being negotiated through the Republicans' contract for America and stuff like that. So this was a very, it was a very politically motivated piece of writing, but also very personal. But very personal, and the two, the two were really colliding in my head in a big way at that time. And and it was, a, it was the first sustained piece of first person writing I had ever done, and it, it really came from that place. Now, Emily, you didn't write about it for more than 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, what made you write about it when you did? Why not before? Why not at, you know, leave it out at all? Mm -hmm. Well, I was back in New Haven. I, I went back to New Haven for a year, uh, the 2008-2009 academic year. And as soon as we arrived, my husband and two daughters, not as soon as, but I think it was late October, mid-October, I have been, I've always, I've experienced adhesions. Um, when your scar tissue become, uh, become uh, scar tissue becomes uh, entangled in your intestines. And it had happened once before, about seven years after I was stabbed, when I um, was first moved to Burlington. And I didn't know what it was at that time. Mm -hmm. And there were months and months of pain um, that I couldn't get, I couldn't get any answer. You know, go to see doctors and they would say, they had all kinds of theories. Um, and then one night, I just, you know, my body just uh, rebelled, and I had to be had to go to the hospital and have more 
um, had, had surgery um, to separate my scar tissue from my intestines. And when I moved to New Haven on, in 2008, I started to have those, I knew what it was, I started to have those recurring pains again. So I had to go to the hospital and I had to tell the, you know, to the medical team, it's adhesions, you know, they're my lower bowel, you have to have a special, you know, test to see that. Um, and of course they refused to, to believe me until, you know, they did the test and they saw what it was. Um, and I think at that point, I just started putting the story together. I, I started to, uh, go, I went to the police station and I, you know, asked for the police records and got the hospital records and talked to the New Haven Register uh, and a lot of people remembered the incident. And it just felt like there's something compelling me to do it at that point. But I think for, for those years uh, in between, I, I, it was just really difficult to accept the impact of the story on my life, even though I kept having these experiences with adhesions. And it felt like it was time to, um, to assimilate the story, to assimilate the ex experience and um, all the information and I think for, write me, for, for me, writing about it was a way of trying to make some order out of the whole chaotic experience and even the adhesions, which I had no control over. Um, you know, I couldn't predict them and I couldn't, uh, there was no way to, to stop them. I, I talked to a, a surgeon uh, in my post-op post -op meeting and she told, I said, will these ever go away? And she said, no, you'll be back in the hospital at some point, but at least now you know what they are. And I think that that, that conversation, uh, I turned to, to, to the story itself as a way of, of exerting my own control and, and turning power, a sense of powerlessness into power. So it was those, I think, confluence of, of events that made me want to write about this finally. I think actually that desire for control was a, a, a making some sense of a senseless series of events also lay very much behind why I wrote about it when I did. And I was kind of fortunate enough to have this platform in which I was encouraged to do it, um, but I think that's a big part of the motivation is to just put some order around this thing, uh, this chaotic explosion in your life, in your family's life. How did the two of you meet? <laughs> we I met, as we met in the hospital. I think yeah. I wandered into your hospital room is what right. I think happened. I, I yeah. think. Um, I think I saw, did I seek you out? I think that's Maybe so, yeah. yeah. And then well, and then we really met. I mean, we we did meet. Then I remember meeting your parents in the hospital. But then we really met about a month later at a kind of strange <laughs> event. Um, in in those days, the uh, one of the sort of protocols for dealing with an, a, a bad event, a traumatic event that a bunch of people go through together, is something called critical incident stress debriefing, which now is not used anymore. It's found to not be helpful. This consists of getting everybody who experienced it into the same room and getting them to tell one another's story. Mm -hmm. And um, the science of it is interesting. But anyway, um, as a journalist, I found it very interesting, actually, to hear the, these, the details from completely different perspectives of what happened. But it was a strange event in part, and I have no idea to this day whether this was sort of psychotherapeutic or weird because the the hosts of this thing, the social workers at Young Haven Hospital, had in the middle of the table some bagels with a block of cream cheese that had, it was one of those cream cheese with that red stripe of, of jam down the middle of it. Very, very weird. I remember remarking on it at the time. <laughs> but I think that was the first time we spent a lot of time right. together. That's right. Yeah. Of course we knew, then we discovered we know a lot of people in common. Yeah. But I, I remember that, that, that session as being very alienating and having the opposite effect. Um, I mean, we're, a lot of us were very angry in the room. And I think even yeah. about, we were part of an experiment. <laughs> we were there, yeah. I think, for the therapist to try out these new muscles of hers. And it, it had the opposite. It was not a healing moment yeah. for me. I felt the same way, I think. Yeah. Uh, speaking of TV drama shows, uh, staple is PTSD. And, you know, at least you, Bruce, who really have become a professional expert in, in post-traumatic stress. So uh, what are we supposed to think about that? Is that a useful term to you? Well, I mean, let me sort of qualify that by saying that my work at the Dart Center, one of the great privileges of it is working alongside people who are experts in trauma and PTSD. I'm not, I'm a journalist. I'm not a psychologist. So I'm, I... I will also say full disclosure, and full disclosure, it's in the essay. I, I mean, I was 
diagnosed with PTSD uh, in the aftermath of this thing. Um, there is a lot of argument in the profession right now in, in, among psychologists and psychiatrists about whether to stick with this label, post-traumatic stress disorder, or to go with post-traumatic stress injury. That's a whole other argument. I find it a very useful concept because whether you're calling it disorder or injury, you're, there's a sense, I certainly experienced a sense, of being changed in unaccountable ways by this event. Um, some of them very physical. I couldn't concentrate. For the first time in my life, I would get to the end of newspaper articles and, and not remember what the lead was. Um, now I'm a little more middle-aged, and this is part of normal life, but at the time, this, this was kind of extreme. Um, I found it very hard uh, to put paragraphs together, um, and I'd been a kind of writing fool up to that point. Um, so there were those kinds of things. There were other, you know, these days, post-traumatic stress disorder is part of the national consciousness. We all know what veterans go through or what 9-11 survivors are some of you in this room perhaps deal with. I think it's very useful because it goes to the idea of, of psychological injury, of changes to the self as a consequence of horror and extremity. Um, as, as, you know, along with the physical process, do, do you have in your head a, a, a time period that the psychological recovery process took? Well, for myself, I don't know how you feel about this. I, I was very lucky. I got referred to a really gifted and uh, experienced PTSD specialist in New Haven. New Haven happens to be a place where there's a VA and is a place where there is a lot of, uh, a lot of expertise in that area. I was treated by a woman named Betsy Brett, who was one of the top PTSD people in the country at the time, still is. Um, there was kind of, for me, a six-month trajectory before I felt like I was functioning pretty much like myself. And that, I mean, I think this I wrote probably toward the end of that six-month period. Um, so there was that period. Um, but then there are ways in which you're changed and the change doesn't go away. So I think recovery is a... Um, is a word I use carefully. Yeah, I think I still, I mean, I, I still uh, have, I still experience it, you know, whatever, I guess, um, I was never like, formally diagnosed, but, uh, and I always thought, you know, well, that belongs to soldiers and you know, people have been through really, really what I consider extreme experiences because, you know, I think the way that denial works is that, you know, it's just hard to accept that something has happened to you and that has changed your life. But I still, when I'm walking down a street and, uh, people start running suddenly, you know, all the flares go up. Um, after as I was writing this essay, I was in a coffee shop and this, uh, I was standing in a line and a man was standing, what I felt was too close to me and I panicked and left. Mm -hmm. And I called a friend who said, well, that was because you were stabbed in a coffee shop. <laughs> I mean, I think it's still hard for me to accept that this yeah. has had, and I remember months after, you know, it happened, going to coffee shops and, uh, uh, you know, saying, God, this, this coffee tastes like mud, you know. And a friend would say, because you were stabbed in a coffee shop. And it was still difficult for me to accept that that had still had these effects on me. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that maybe these things, unfortunately, I mean, it's hard to, to admit this, but I think it, it has changed me dramatically. I don't know that it will ever go away. I mean, Bruce wrote about experiencing this kind of extreme anger that he hadn't ever really yeah. felt. And I think when, when I do see yeah. people running suddenly or when I do feel, um, you know, and I know it's irrationally kind of menaced, you know, yeah. people standing too close to me, I feel really angry. You know, because there's something happening in my body and my psyche that I can't control, um, and that's something I do I do experience very often, actually. Unfortunately, do, is, do you process this whole experience, each of you, as having a lesson, personal lesson, a political lesson, a social lesson, um, that may not be applicable, but you know, we're in sort of in the air of the culture, you know when something bad happens to you, uh, if it's a movie, by the third reel, there's, you're gonna you know, get to closure and you're gonna learn something from it or something like mm -hmm. that. Does anything like that happen? It's interesting. I, 
I draw bits and pieces of meaning from this. I mean, in, you know, as far back as 1995, when I wrote this, I was trying to extract a kind of, kind of political meanings. Um, certainly, I've tried to have whatever insights about violence this event has given me be useful, so there's that kind of meaning. On the other hand, the, the more time goes on, the more I'm convinced of the kind of arbitrariness of the universe and, and I, the kind of meaninglessness of it in some ways is the most enduring lesson for me. And, well, and also the impact, when we live in a world in which um, we send soldiers off to war in which we deal with emergencies like disasters like Sandy. And I, I think I do kind of seek meaning, a meaning that is applicable to those situations. What, what do we need to understand about violence and what it does to people in order to be good citizens? I, I guess there's that. Um, but I resist every effort to tie it up with a bow. That more and more and more. I guess that's where I settle. I've, I've always found it interesting, the reactions of other people. Yeah. I think in some ways uh, an experience like this affects other people more than it does you, or had, that's been true for me. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been such a range of experiences. I mean, people who care about you yeah. are really angry, and they've, in my case, I've had people you know, just passionately want this man to, to you know, be brought to justice and to be punished. And yeah. that it wasn't my reaction throughout these, all of these years to what happened, because he was so clearly imbalanced. Um, and I, I don't know what it's like to look into the eyes of someone who really, really wants to hurt you. Because this person was just so, he wasn't there. Yeah. I, I had the same, exactly yeah. the same feeling. I mean, I, I was never able to get a lot of personal anger going mm -hmm. at, at Daniel Silva. Mm -hmm. Have um, you talked to your children about it? Yeah, I have. Um, you know, I mean, my children, you know, they, they're very well acquainted with my body. So they ask often about the scar and what it means. And, you know, I think it, it's at once uh, something they just know about mommy. That's something that happened to mommy. Um, and I always try to reassure them. Because it makes the world, you know, then they have to think about it as a scary place, you know. And they ask, you know, what happened is hard to explain. It's hard to explain, I think, to, to anyone. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I even understand it, but I always make sure to reassure them. Like, I reassure, I think, everyone who meets me, you know, this, this won't happen to you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you won't turn a corner and have someone with a knife. And I think my daughters need that reassurance, but they also find it really interesting, you know? And maybe because I kind of treat it that way. Um, they ask me what was wrong with this person, and I yeah. tried to say he was really sick. Yeah. Um, but I think in the, in, when they saw me, and I wrote about this as well, um, in that year when I was in the hospital and they were here in the world, um, they were terrified. You know, they came home one day and their mom was not there. And then to see your parent, I mean, it's really very, and then some, you know, then they'll tell the story. I mean, I think we have all have stories, you know, about our parents that suddenly yeah. belong to us, you know, and we tell them as if we were there. Um, maybe the story of your parents meeting or something. And, yeah. you know, and I have to, this is a story about their lives yeah. now, you know, and it's become part of who they are, that this happened to their mother. Yeah. Um, and, and for us, I mean, certainly for our, for my family, this was a huge piece of the landscape. My stepdaughter was 10 years old at the time. My, she and my wife were in Ireland at a, a folk music festival at, on the night that this happened. And they, uh, Margaret heard the news on a, uh, a series of phone messages that she picked up from the answering machine. So the unfolding of these events was a very big part of, uh, of my stepdaughter Aoife's sort of middle childhood. And so it's always there. Uh, there's a delicate balance between how much you talk about it and how much you don't. And there have been years in which we, probably years in which we didn't discuss it much, but it's been a big part of family life. And there are always developments in the case, uh, news from you know other Emily or other friends who, who were in one way or another connected to this. Um, it, it's, it changes your family life in big ways. And certainly for us, it was openly on the scene. There, there was no question about talking about it or not. Aoife needed to know about it. And, and she was two days later there in the hospital with me. So. 
Does the word or concept victim resonate with you or feel like a self-description? I don't think so. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think I can, I don't think of, uh, I, I haven't ever really thought of myself as a victim of this. And I think that's something that um, maybe I see in other people's eyes, you know, that sense of not quite pity, but, you know, the sympathy. Um, and it's a central story for many people who come to know you. But, um, and I don't necessarily see myself as a survivor either. I mean, I guess those terms, they don't really, they don't really fit the way that I've experienced this. I mean, it's something that happened to me. Um, but the way in which it happened to me and uh, it's still something I'm trying to understand. I think that was one of the, you know, the way that memory works is something we both talked about in, yeah. in these essays. And, um, you know, I, th I think I'm still, you know, unpacking it. And so it doesn't fit, I think, into that category of a victim. It, it, it's an interesting question. And for me, it's now gotten so layered over by debates within journalism and debates between victim advocates and journalists. And um, there's a whole argument about whether victim or survivor grants more dignity. Like Emily, I don't, I don't particularly resonate either way. Um, if I think about it a lot, I think maybe the word victim is necessary because it captures the, the powerlessness mm. that is essential. That is was my experience anyway of, of this event. And I think if you, don't want to on some level contend with powerlessness, you're going to miss some mm. dimension of this. I know why people want to use the word survivor. I, yeah, neither one has a particular resonance for me emotionally, but it's become, as I say, very laid over with arguments among journalists. And I mean, I'm with, at the Dart Center, we use these words interchangeably and sometimes advisedly in one way or another. It's complicated. As, speaking of journalism, what's it feel like to be a news story? <laughs> <laughs> It is so weird. Well, uh, describe how w the ways in which you were a news story, or maybe still are. I don't remember this as, as I mean, I was, I, I don't rem remember the reporters and the, um, I remember being very shocked to see myself, you know, in the newspaper, and yes, my name and age and address, and actually the reporter made a point of saying that my birthday, you know, her birthday is on Thursday or something, which felt like a really intimate detail, even more intimate than the fact that I was stabbed. So, you know, you seeing yourself laid out there, and you become, you know, a set of sentences or paragraphs. That was really startling to me. But um, I, I, I was able, for whatever, you know, I, to to kind of turn away from that. And I don't remember um, having to deal with these things. I think as dramatically as you did. Yeah. Well, it may, and that may be also a difference in the kind of extremity of our injuries. Because while I I, I was not in great shape and was in the hospital for a while, you were in mm -hmm. worse shape mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was very aware that this was a big deal news story. I mean, and the background would be that it happened on a slow news night in August, <laughs> and and all of the people, all seven people who were stabbed, were what you might call deserving victims, or you know, Yale faculty or uh -huh. students or writers or whatever. So there was lots of attention. It was huge in the local press for days and days. It was on the front page of the Metro section of the New York Times. So there was this kind of media buzz. Um, for me, it, it, there was the strangeness of it began with getting a call while I was still in the recovery room. Some enterprising reporter from the local TV station called and asked me how I felt. And I was doped up on morphine and knew enough somehow nonetheless to say, go fuck off. I was really not interested in talking. Um, I had some encounters with reporters that were very good. Some really sought my permission for interviews and really were very careful. Um, some TV reporters especially were very intrusive, followed my friends around. The local newspaper put some very gory pictures on the front page, which upset my family, I remember, very much. Um, and printed as well the addresses of all seven victims, which struck me as incredibly stupid and just an invitation to local burglars everywhere. You know, these people are all at the hospital. <laughs> go, and, go and steal all their worldly possessions. Um, I was very angry about that. Um, I, I had a lot. I was very, very angry. 
without that kind of press coverage. Felt very exploited for a long time. And in fact, the early drafts of this essay um, focused a lot more on that and were very, I, I felt very um, exploited in driving news coverage. Um, and uh, it, it kind of was hijacking the essay, so a lot of that came out. On the other hand, there were some remarkably compassionate moments. I mean, one of the things I didn't learn until later, there was one local reporter who had been driving around in his car the night that this happened and happened to be in the neighborhood, heard about it on, the, uh, on his scanner, showed up and had exclusive access to this crime scene, had gotten there before the cops, before the medics, before anybody else. And he kind of looked around and said, oh my God, this coffee shop was down a little narrow street. He closed up his notebook, went to the top of the street to steer the ambulances down and lost his, his access to the scene. He made me swear not to tell anyone 15 years ago because he was afraid he would get fired. But uh, it was a complicated thing. And I, I kept trying to feel professional kinship with journalists and think about how I would have handled these situations, but also was very aware of a lot of really sloppy judgment calls and um, a lot of exploitative day-to-day -day behavior. I'm about to invite you all to comment or ask questions. One last thing, um, uh, another sort of social system, just if you have any comments on, is the legal system, um, as you saw it move forward for probably years through this. What do you the legal system. Um, well, I want to say, actually, I did get a call from a reporter when, um, when Daniel Silva, it was, yeah. I guess, last year. Last year, 2010, two years ago now, yeah. Right, where he was going to be released from, you know, his halfway. Right, or released from the state hospital, right, yeah. Right, exactly, the state hospital. And I, I felt very irritated. Um, one, that they had sort of found me, you know, I was living in Vermont, and that they wanted to do a quick quotation. My feelings about it were so much more complicated, you know, but I didn't want to give that to this reporter. He obviously just wanted a few words. Um, I, I, in terms of, I guess, the question of, of, of of justice, I don't know. Um, he was somebody who clearly needed to be hospitalized. You know, thank you, Ronald Reagan. He was deinstitutionalized too early, and that's what the that's what the real crime was, I think, in the situation. Um, and in terms of, I guess, um, what happened to him, uh, you know, I guess we'll see. I don't know. What are your feelings? About well, I, I don't have I don't have a lot of feelings about how the system dealt with Silva. It seemed to me that it dealt with him well. I mean, my feeling at the time was. Whether he's sane or crazy, what I care about is that my family and my friends and I are all safe mm -hmm. and that a dangerous person is not on the street. And if he's kept contained in a secure psychiatric hospital or if he's kept contained in a secure prison, it makes no difference to me. I didn't have any feelings about vengeance. I did have a feeling, and I retained this and retained this up through last year when Silva was released, that there's this, this strange point at which this series, the, 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 the injury to me, um, kind of gets, becomes a piece of furniture in the judicial process. There's a, there's a moment at which what is your story becomes the system's story. And you as the survivor or victim or whatever it is you are, are, are a piece of evidence. And I, I did have a sense despite the presence of victim advocates and other changes that I think give people a little more voice, that the process is not really about us. It's about doing the work of the law, which I mean, I, I mean this is a motif with the reporters, with the surgeon who stuck his hand in your wound. Sort of once you create professions, they, they almost by definition tend not to be holistic and to sort of say, we have a function, we perform it. Well, it's yeah, but it's also about whose, it's about whose story it is. I mean, I, Emily or I would, you know, understand this as injuries to ourselves. The court system understands it as an injury to the state, and I never really knew what that meant until there would be developments in this case that I suddenly read about in the newspaper and I'm not called up about, including Silva's release last year. Um, I was, interestingly, I was, in, I was in Norway a couple of months ago and had a, had a chance to, because of my work with the Dart Center, observe part of the Breivik trial, the Utoya shootings. Norway actually gives, and I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but 
victims have full representation throughout the trial. There's a counsel for the victims who gets to cross-examine the defendant just as uh, the prosecutor or defense lawyer do here. So that you're an actually a much more complete party. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I certainly did have a sense, in, and it may even help motivate the writing of this thing, I don't know, a sense in which the story was moving away from me mm -hmm. and onto somebody else's needs. Okay, um, Victor. Yeah. I mean, maybe, if you, Victor, if you and other people could use the mic, which is in the back there. Ariel, could you? <laughs> for, yeah. yeah, thank you. This is for Bruce. I'm curious about how your experience relates to your work at the Dart Center. How you got there, yeah. whether you, that was part of the thing that motivated you to do this and, and why you're still there and how it affects what you do. So. It's, it's an interesting question and it's, it's um, well, maybe it's not that complicated. It relates certainly directly to the work I was doing at The Nation at the time and, and the publication of this essay. Um, when it came, when this essay came out, um, actually my psychotherapist pointed out to me that there was a little foundation in Michigan called the Dart Foundation that was giving an award for uh, outstanding reporting on victims of violence, and it carried a very big cash prize at that time. And since I was I was being paid by the nation, I loved the idea of a big cash prize. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I I sent this thing in. I got a call from the woman who, who ran the, the DART award at Michigan State University uh, who said, well, it's only for daily newspapers, but I read your piece when it came out and I loved it. Would you come and be the keynote speaker at our, at our dinner? So I was the keynote speaker at the first or second, second DART award in 1995. And at that dinner met uh, a psychiatrist named Frank Ockberg and a few other people um, who it turned out were like me, journalists or mental health people or educators sort of in different places around the country beginning to ask some of the same questions. And we formed a kind of loose network and began asking these questions about journalism and journalism practice more systematically. And the DART Foundation, which is based in Michigan and it's the family foundation of the people who invented the styrofoam coffee cup, um, generously agreed to support a more ambitious project, first based at the University of Washington because there was a faculty member there named Roger Simpson who was part of this conversation, and then here at Columbia. It started out as a kind of little sliver of consulting time, but as time went on, um, the issues and themes of how we tell the stories of violence and uh, how the public's understanding of these issues shapes our decisions as a society, very much intertwined with the articles and editorials I was writing for The Nation, became more and more important for me, um, especially 9-11 and Katrina and the Iraq War. In some ways, my deepening involvement with this bouncing off of the stabbing and beginning to write about it were a kind of personal response to all of those events. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's the rough narrative. First of all, I want to thank you both for agreeing to be on this panel and to open yourself up to grapple with these issues again. Yeah, we just want to move the mic your way because we're. Can you hear me better? Well, it's, yeah, we need to mic you for taping, so we're oh. video. Oh, yeah. Again, I just want to thank you both for being on the panel and opening yourself up to these issues again. Uh, having been involved in the criminal justice system myself some time ago and having tried a murder case where the defense was insanity. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk again about the issue of anger. Uh, we, you touched briefly on it, uh, whether your, your anger or lack of anger, whether that's changed over the years as you've experienced different types of trauma uh, from the incident, and whether uh, Mr. Silva's mental status had anything to do with your, either your anger or your lack of anger. That's one question. Second question is, since what happened to you happened to you, it's been a movement in the criminal justice system to incorporate victims' feelings more, and, uh, especially in relation to sentencing and in release of individuals who have been uh, incarcerated. Did you have that opportunity? Did you want that opportunity? And did you take advantage of it? Um, yeah, the question of anger, I just, I, I don't feel it, I think, 
towards Silva, for whatever you know, strange reason. Um, I had never have, and I've searched deep inside, but I don't have the feeling toward him. Um, and it could just be, it could just be the, my psychological makeup, and it could just be repression, you know? But I, I don't have the anger at him. I, have, I feel frustrated with the fact that he was deinstitutionalized, and that feels to me, um, I mean, if he hadn't been, if he'd been cared for in an appropriate way, this obviously would not have happened. I think if anyone had died, I, th I think my, obviously my, our response, our experiences would be absolutely, you know, completely different. Um, I feel, as I said, I, the anger though is there, you know, and I carry it physically, so that when I do, I am, you know, my body recalls the experience, you know, when I'm, as I see people running suddenly, if, if I feel people are getting too close to me, I do feel rage, um, and I do feel that I now. Um, that you understand, I think I understand how, how vulnerable our bodies are. Um, I, I feel that uh, I have capacities to um, protect myself. You know, I think my feeling is I'm not gonna let that happen again. And I don't feel as shy about, um, uh, you know, experiencing that anger, that sense of, um, you know, that it would be okay for me to protect myself in a really, you know, extreme way. I think I would have felt differently about that before this happened. So, um, and, you know, when we were, I know that the, when I read the article about Silva being released, there were other people who were, who were stabbed who had very strong feelings that he should not be released. <coughs> I was living in, I am living in Burlington, Vermont when I read this. I didn't feel threatened. Yeah. But when I was living in New Haven, I thought about the fact that, you know, how strange it would be to be walking down the street and um, to encounter this person. I don't know that I would even remember him. Maybe I would on some, on some level. But I think that, you know, his mental state is really, really complicated, and we don't have solutions now at, currently for schizophrenia. You know, it really is a life sentence. Um, and that, I feel, I do feel compassion um, toward him. But again, I think the fact that, you know, we all survived, um, I don't feel that it's made a, a lasting, had, had a, has a lasting um, negative impact on my life, although the, these occasions are pretty serious when they come up. Yeah. Um, I have a feeling all the time that it could have been much worse. But I don't, I don't, um, I don't feel any anger toward, toward him as an individual. Yeah, I, I, I've, I mean, like Emily, I've kind of struggled with myself and tried to find the lie. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, there are plenty of ways in which I've lied to myself or others about this incident, but th this isn't one of them. I have not, I don't feel personal anger, anger toward Daniel Silva. I, I, I was, and in some ways still am, quicker to anger as a consequence of this stabbing. And, um, under specific circumstances, sometimes very political. There was a time some years ago when I was engaged in a kind of a political fight around a project um, and found myself getting kind of elevated in a, in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time. And I said, oh, okay, I recognize that. I'm being attacked, I get it, okay. But I, like Emily, I, I understand that it's biological. I, I feel it as a, as a change in me and I really don't carry that kind of anger. In terms of the important issue of incorporating victims' feelings in, in sentencing, and this is something I, I spent a few years thinking a lot about and, and writing about um, after this. I spent several years writing about victims in, in the criminal justice system. And I, I certainly have come to feel that have victims having a voice in sentencing is important, or it, a sense of the victim's individual injury being a part of it is very important. Um, I, at the same time, feel very strongly that the desire of survivors or victims for representation in the legal system has often been exploited in very dangerous ways by people who have other agendas, uh, pushing kind of tough on crime laws or who, people who, who want the public face of all victims and survivors to be angry and vengeful. Um, the idea of victims as the voice of vengeance has, 
driven politics in this country for a while, and I, I don't like being part of that either. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, let's see, you were next, I think, in back. Yes. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, this is a very fabulous panel. I thank you. I'm wondering uh, about what you feel about a movement that grew up kind of in the opposite direction from the victims' rights movement, which is restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And whether, although your particular case isn't very apt because the man was ill and uh, no one was killed, but you must have given some thought to the question about whether a victim should be encouraged to communicate indirectly or directly. Uh, or otherwise have their relationships mediated uh, so that there is some confrontation of, of the perpetrator mm. and, the, and the, I hate to use the word victim, but that's the only word here. You know, I mean, you know, were you, how did you feel about when he apologized to the court? Yeah. I, I was, you know, I accept it. Yeah. You know, I felt um, I felt that was a, a, an important were, occasion. Were you there? No, I was not. No, and we, yeah. we should, and that we 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 could have been invited and weren't. Right. But uh, he was. This was last year, and he he it prep, in preparation for his release to a halfway house. He said, you know, I was out of. I, he said essentially, I was ill at that time. I had no idea what I was doing, and I apologized to everybody. Right. And if I'd been in my right mind, I never would have done this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but 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 look. I mean, I think. I've wrestled with this as someone who, on the one hand, has been because of this experience looking at the role of victims and thinking about these issues. On the other hand, as someone with a long interest in and commitment to civil rights and civil liberties and, and the rights of, of defendants. I think the idea of restorative justice in many cases, especially, uh, well, in a, in a lot of cases, can be very powerful. The idea that when both sides are willing, willing, and it's not coercive in any way, that there's some understanding between victim and perpetrator, and it's not simply um, kind of the big hand of the state saying, okay, the parties are now separated forever. That can be very powerful. At, at the same time, I'm always wary of things that, that, that could reduce Justice, which does have this important social dimension, to to me versus him. I, I think you know I, it, it's complicated. I, restor the restorative justice programs I'm aware of are terrific. There's also a very um, an excellent legal scholar named Susan Herman who's written a book called Parallel Justice, which to me gets to it a little bit more richly, which says essentially. Victims have a whole range of needs that we as a society choose not to deal with very much. There are needs often for medical support. There certainly was in my case. There's a need for health insurance. Uh, there's a need for psychological treatment sometimes. There's a need for family support. There's a need for all kinds of stuff. Um, and until we're dealing with those things, the rest of it is kind of phony that victims' rights is fine, but it's a substitute in some ways for asking what are the actual needs of victims, what are the things that can make victims' lives, lives better, not just what satisfies some cartoon of vengeance. Uh, let's see. You were next, I think. I'm trying to remember the order in which the hands went up. Um, thanks, guys. This is an extremely fascinating panel, and I think... Um, as a writer who's been through trauma, perhaps I'm particularly interested in this one angle, which is um, for many of us writing is, you know, many of us find solace in writing, even if we're writing about just something that has nothing to do with our lives. You know, during a difficult period, you might just throw yourself into an article you're working on and sort of distract yourself. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who are journalists, but who are kind of too scared to write about their own stories for mm. fear that It'll just bring up all this stuff that we're very good at, and I think Emily, you especially, seem, I, I sort of relate to you, you know, some of us are very good at sort of laughing it off and sort of distancing ourselves. Um, and I know that, Bruce, you started writing about it so much sooner. Um, 
I'm just curious if you have advice, you know, is there this sort of magical movie catharsis that comes out of writing or is it really hard and do you have, you know, when you were each writing your pieces, did you have moments where maybe you were very upset, very difficult, you know, with your loved ones, sort of didn't want to talk to anyone after sitting in your room and, and working on it? Um, you're absolutely right, you know, about laughing about it. I mean, it just sometimes just seems so ridiculous that this happened. I mean, so it wasn't supposed to happen. Um, you know, I thought that writing about it, as I said, would be a way of kind of controlling it and managing it um, and turning it into something really beautiful. But I actually re-experienced a lot of the trauma. Um, so that wasn't something I did not expect. So, um, yeah, in terms of, I think, um, but there was some satisfaction in ordering it, you know, and making an outline mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, the rhythm of the piece and the, the finding a way to kind of use the drama of the situation to create an experience I imagined I wanted the reader to have. But I, yeah, I, I think um, I got tangled up in it in a different way and I was forced obviously to remember it. Um, so it sort of had that paradoxical effect I think. Um, but I think being able to make a record of it, for me it was a way of remembering it because I didn't, um, I didn't really remember a lot of what happened. I still don't feel like I, I did. And the, I think the person on the paper, the way I tell the story here is much more true to, it's a different kind of, it's a different thing and much more, I think, true to, to how I can, to how I feel about it. And, you know, I, the way I talk about it here is, it's different than talking about it now. Um, and there were more challenges and there were more satisfying results from it. But I will, I will say that I, I not, that I wasn't expecting to feel it as deeply, as strange as that sounds, as I was writing it. Um, you know, I was trying to, I think, create, to, to, to collapse the gap um, between how I talked about it and how I really thought I, I experienced it. But, and there was that. And it's, it's hard to read. You know, as, I don't know for you, but it was hard to read. For years, I couldn't read Bruce's essay. And actually, a really good friend of mine who's here tonight read the essay when I was, I think, uh, um, I'd heard about it. And actually, a professor at, at Yale, where I was in graduate school, used it in the class, which I, I found really uncomfortable um, that he hadn't asked me about it. Someone I knew. Um, I, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, that, I don't know why, why that person wow. made that choice. Again, the reactions of other people have been fascinating. Um, but a, like, a dear friend of mine read it and said, don't read it um, right now. And years before, it wasn't until I started to write this essay that I was able to read Bruce's essay. But, but I, I think as a writer, you probably have no choice but to sit down and, and do it um, and put that story on the paper. And then, you know, I, and you'll find, I think, I found out what I felt about it as I was writing it down. And there are more stories to, think, to tell about the story of, of writing, writing it down. But it was a fascinating experience, I think, as a, as a writer to do that. There, I mean, I've... I'm going to sort of do the same thing and talk a little bit about the experience of writing it and then the experience of reading Emily's essay. Um, I, uh, I came at this very much as a, as a journalist, um, meaning, I mean, were the, that was the place I started, meaning, among other things, that I rarely, if ever, wrote about myself. I, I was there with the objective eye in most things I wrote, whether they were articles or editorials or investigative pieces or whatever, um, up until this piece. And, um, and I also generally always had control of my material. I would do my interviews, I would get my notes, I would, I, you know, relying on the material of the world to produce a piece of journalism. Um, this piece, when I sat down to write it, and I did sit down to write it almost immediately after this strange experience with the television set challenged me in, in, in two ways. One was, uh, talent challenged my toolbox in a couple of ways. One, one was that it, I had to write about myself, and not only did I have to write about myself, but the experience had left me open, and writing about it in turn reopened, a whole set of associate, a sort of associative existence which is the experience of, it's the way people who write novels or who make paintings or who write plays work. It was not the way I as a journalist had worked up until that point. 
Um, so, that, you know, much more about the images, much more about the, the the memory that comes unbidden, much more about um, the stuff that's jangling around inside. And at the same time, putting that alongside what I already knew how to do, I certainly sat down the way I would with any other story with a timeline and news clips, and I, I did my whole, did my investigative reporter thing on this, but the investigative reporter thing wasn't enough. There was this whole associative thing going on, and I needed, whether it was first person or not, I needed to find my way into that part of myself, and I'm very glad I did. That was a very uh, challenging but important step for me as a writer. The other part of being a journalist that was true before this essay was that I was always someone who would write fairly polished stuff fairly quickly. And this one, I don't, I don't know if Victor remembers this, but this went through you were mostly away that year, but this went through more drafts than probably articles I had ever written up until that point. I mean, it was a really brutal process of editing, beginning with, with my editors at home and up to and including all, many of my colleagues at The Nation who read it, gave all kinds of comments <coughs> at various points along the way. Um, I was very aware that I was dealing with something big that I didn't have good judgment about necessarily and needed a lot of feedback. So there was that craft challenge. Then fast forward and I read Emily's piece when it came out last year and a, a couple of things struck me. One was her, there's a, a, a kind of courage in her piece that how you translate it into craft is still a little bit of a mystery to me, which is the way in which you, um, your granular description of the ongoing impact of this event in your life is is really a very brave thing um, and is a kind of exposure that um, both from a personal point of view and a craft point of view is is really challenging and difficult. Emily's essay really tries to tell the truth in a very particular way. I mean, I, and when I reread my essay now, which I don't do often or willingly. Um, there are things in it that I like as a, from a craft point of view. There are things in it I, I argue with myself about. There are places in which I think I overstated, uh, mis even misrepresented the, some facts about the way people related to one another on that night in order to make a political point. I find myself, and this may reflect the journalistic roots of my writing, having, f making too many intellectual shortcuts in this. Um, so there's, a, there's the process of reading as well as the process of writing, and um, that's a big challenge in something like this. I do think if you're talking about what you might do as a journalist, Stretching these muscles in these different ways is a good thing to do. It's not easy, but it's a good thing to do. I think you were next. Okay. Thanks. Hi, it's been a great uh, panel so far. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted you to touch on something that you've, or maybe I speak more directly about something you've already touched on, and some, it's a concept that I find myself increasingly suspicious of as I get older and see more about the world, and that's the idea of closure. And I'm wondering how real you think closure is. And I, I think it matters partly because it's so often used to justify many aspects of the criminal justice system, and in particular, the death penalty. So I would just like to hear your thoughts on your personal experiences and then from a broader perspective in regard to policy, maybe. Well, I would, I'll just say, I guess, on, on a, maybe I'll talk about the, just the writing of this essay. And I must say, I mean, it's. When, when I read the article and a friend of mine sent it, and that really happened, <laughs> a friend of mine sent me, uh, emailed me the article when, about Daniel Silva being released, and, and she said, is this you? And I thought, there's my ending to this. I mean, probably even more, more than I felt anything about what happened, I thought, there's the ending to the essay, you know, that I've been kind of writing for, for so many years and telling the story for many years. So I think, I think that there was, as you say that, I think, well, there were some that's what I was after, you know, not only in terms of this essay, but maybe in that larger sense, the sense of closure about it. But I think what I've had to accept about, you know, my own injury is that it'll never be over, you know. And I think in some ways writing this, you know, both for both Bruce and, you know, 
if we had been, if this had happened, you know, 50 years ago, we might not be alive. I mean, yeah. our yeah. injuries were so dramatic. Oh yeah. You know that that uh, that there may we may have died from what happened to us. So the fact that I know right now that however many years I have left, they will be punctuated by you know having to go back to the hospital and these adhesions. Um, you know, that's something I have to accept along with the fact that um, that that it's over, at the same time it is over in some really profound way. He's been released and hopefully he will stay on his medication and not do this again. Um, but the, you know, impact of my life is, is sort of forever. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a, that's the only thing I know about the future really, is that this will be part of it. I'll take it with me forever, no matter whatever hap else happens in my life. So yeah, that, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's some, I've had to accept that there will be no closure for me in this experience. Yeah, I have a profound allergy to, to the <laughs> word closure. I really just need to get out the Benadryl immediately when people start talking about that. And it's partly personal and partly political. The personal part is exactly as Emily said. Um, the smaller and larger resonances of this event will be with me in one way or another. And it's not that I have nightmares every night or something or, you know, but but part of accepting the awfulness of, of experience is, is, you know, kind of the way Primo Levi r writes about his experiences of, of uh, the Holocaust is of this series of facts that just will not go away. There's nothing you can do to make the awfulness go away. There's nothing you can do to make you know, the awfulness of someone dying on 9-11 go away or the awfulness of, of, of a soldier losing a leg in Iraq go away. You know, Tammy Duckworth gets elected to the United States Congress, but she, is, she lives with what she lives with, and that's just an existential fact. Um, and I certainly think closure has gotten politically exploited over the years. It's there's, there's really two versions of this. If you say one yeah. branch is it never ends, which is what they're saying, the other branches it ends. That has two branches. Closure is sort of it ends for liberals. You come to peace. Then there's revenge, a word that hasn't been used yet. But that's the kind of pop culture version. That's the ballot initiative version. You know, right. let's get him, um, lock him up, and throw away the key at best. And, well, well, and I and I think it's going to make everybody sort of feel better, and then it'll be over. And and I think there's also a kind of social version of that, which is that people think, you know, is either conflict or war. It's not just even about individual, right. or conflict or peace. It's not just about uh, I individuals when they talk about closure. And I think reality is more complicated. Reality is about living with uncomfortable facts. Um, and I, I mean, you mentioned death penalty. This is something I've, I've written a lot about, but it's, uh, there have, you know, there, there is no study there have been a lot of psychological studies of, of, death, of, of families of murder victims, and there's not one study showing that, that execution helps families of survivors. It, it doesn't in the long run. It's so deep. In, you know, in California on Tuesday, mm -hmm. big liberal sweep on everything, every initiative except death penalty. People yeah. just love the death penalty. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, that, that's part of the American, part yeah. of American exceptionalism. Uh, yeah. It's complicated. Arlene? Since this is a journalism school, I was wondering what you would say to the reporters who covered you back then. What lessons did you learn on how they could have done it better? All right, I'll start. I mean, well, I spend all day doing this, right? But uh, I mean, well, actually, I have, I have two answers to that. One, one is that I learned from them and still do. There was a reporter at that time, the crime reporter at the New Haven Register named Josh Kovner, uh, who now I think is at the Hartford Current, who, who dealt with me, though I barely knew him, with such regard and respect when I was still in the hospital and sought my permission and explained what he was going to be doing, even though he knew that I was a journalist and theoretically should understand this. Um, I thought a lot about that encounter and, and what went right in that encounter. Um, the seeking of special permission, special levels of permission, not treating, whether you wanna call people victims or survivors or whatever, people who've been traumatized as the same way that you treat 
other kinds of sources. I, I understand it as, a, as an experience of power versus powerlessness, that our toolkit as reporters is really very oriented toward people who have power. We, we have a whole set of practices and rules that are very effective at sticking our foot in the door of presidents or, or, or police chiefs or corporate executives and, and getting them to talk whether they want to or not, sometimes subtly, sometimes rather brutally. But we're not so well trained usually and not so experienced at dealing with people who don't have power. And when you're yeah. dealing with crime victims, you're talking about people who've had yeah, it, all kinds of power taken away. It's worth noting that what pulled the thread that made the whole garment fall apart in phone hacking yeah. was uh, a, an ordinary crime victim. That, that, very After much. After years and years and years of pulling the same stuff to, yeah. you know, politicians and royals and people no, like no, that. No, 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 that, that, that's it right. It really struck a nerve when they, they took those that girl's um, family's mm, voicemails. Vo voicemails, no, that's yeah. right. The, the re-victimization of victims is, 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 is terrible and has to do with with powerlessness, and we need a whole set of techniques and practices to interview and report on people who have less power. It involves giving up, giving up some power as journalists, giving some power back, seeking levels of permission, and you know. And whether whatever. it's done here, I mean, all of us of uh, roughly the age of Arlene and myself have had editors who said, "You got to go in the house." Take the picture of the dead girl off yeah. the mantelpiece, put it under yeah. your coat, yeah. and get it. You know, yeah. so I mean, there is a sort of a tradition of that in journalism, and uh, you know, it's it's not you pretty, but it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we're we're down to our last couple of questions. By the way, we're getting down to the end. So I know Bruce and. We've talked about it. Uh, I actually, I coming at it from a little, I was actually attacked and when I was working as a journalist uh, by six guys and uh, I, I'm a photographer. And the, what happened, I actually, it's very interesting and I don't actually have because of what happened the memory because I had a, a traumatic brain injury and uh, so I've been trying to put together a visual telling of this. And the majority of the photographs are from stuff that happened afterward in a brain injury rehab place. But I'm very, I think what's, and it, it's been, I kind of relate to you a little bit more because it's been years and it's taken a while. And I, I've wondered about uh, two things though about and it's also a little bit like your, your question about closure. Do you think it's, it's been hard to try and feel that I can know enough, like circle myself around everything that happened in a way to really sort of tell it, to really tell a kind of, to tell it in a really, in a true way. And I think a lot of it that feeling in me because of the really extensive criminal justice process I had to go through three trials and uh, and what my truth was sort of on the line versus this guy because uh, he was not insane and he did have that look in his eye that you were talking about and I'm wondering you know especially like for Bruce I'm like to to sit here now and it was a long time now since you wrote your piece and you've lived a lot, you've learned a lot about trauma and things. Do you ever think, yeah, well, maybe I am gonna write about this again? Or do you, fe do you feel like this time that, that you've told it, that's gonna be it? Mm -hmm. Or do you, w are you open to the idea that you could know some things that are worth telling about this event? that it's still reverberating in ways that you can tell people about. That's uh, thanks, John. That's an interesting question. Um, and I should say that John Trotter's incredible photo photographic essay on his recovery from traumatic brain injury is on the Dart Center website. Brief ad. But John is a friend and an extraordinary uh, artist. Uh, so you should look at his stuff, which does tell the truth. Um, I, after this essay came out, it got a fair amount of attention. 
And at the time, I thought I had a lot more to say and thought I was going to do a book about it, actually. Um, got partway into it and found either that I was wrong and didn't have much more to say at that time or wasn't ready to say it or whatever, and I never did the book. Um, I'm certainly, I think, I think if, if you're going to care about um, the meaning of an experience like this in your own life and its impact, if I'm a writer at all, I have to be open to the idea of sometime revisiting it so I can imagine it. Um, at the same time, I also feel a big desire to have this be part of my biography but not own me. Um, and I've kind of taken a lot of that energy and put it into the work that we do here, here at the Dart Center. And instead of maybe writing more about myself, I've tried to think about uh, how this little experience connects up with the big experiences of the world in, in which we live. Um, you know, you also think about the impact on your family. This was not an an easy experience writing about this, publishing it for for my family. Um, and it's not that that would, pre under all circumstances, prevent me from, from telling the truth, but the deeper, the deepest truths of how an event like this plays out in your life um, are often very, very intimate and um, might be hard, hard places to go. I don't know. Uh, that's one reason I actually admire your, your essay so much. Um, but it's a good question. I, I don't have a good answer, I guess. A um, couple more questions. Okay. Yeah, you can. Okay, you guys are the last two. Okay. Um, I was wondering how does um, this act of storytelling, telling publicly, writing, sharing with your friends and family, and listening to each other's stories influences your memories and recalling. Mm -hmm. Do you think you tend to exaggerate details, remove, <laughs> forget, change the timeline, or you have this version that you want to be loyal to? You know, I remember the uh, doctors telling my parents, or probably the nurses, telling my parents when they came that, that I was already talking about it after you know, my hospital bed, and they thought that was a really good sign, a way of healing, that that was one of the signs I identified. Um, definitely, I think you, know, you tell a story and you start to lie. You, know, you put it on the paper and you're thinking about how to introduce everything, and I think that's what, for me writing it, was I had to give up, actually, the idea that I could tell the truth because um, and that's one reason I actually didn't read Bruce's essay while I was writing, because I thought I don't want to, I don't want to um, tell Bruce's story, yeah. you know. And because there's Bruce, there's so many, you know, enviable skill here. So much, I thought, well, I, I have to sort of let that be its own thing. But I, I think so, and I think that you know is, is something we do just to, you know, um, exert control over the things yeah. that happen to us. But I think for me it was also to write it was a way of getting, trying to get beneath that and trying to leave those edges a little jagged. Um, and to admit, I think, to myself uh, that I don't have control over it. You know, I don't really remember all these things. And certainly to go back to the newspaper reports, it was stunning. You know, I had, again, I wrote about how I read about the blood on the walls. There was blood everywhere. The bloodbath was one of the headlines. And I thought, well, that's just not true. But apparently it was true. Um, and as I you know, communicated to Bruce about it over the course of, well, we, I shared it with him before I, uh, it came into print. Um, you know, but it was still my story. You know, my story, there isn't a bloodbath. You know, in my story, these other things are happening. And so, um, but I had to look at these other stories as well. It was very actually fascinating to read the police reports. Does it sound strange, but there was a kind of tenderness in some of these reports. Um, I was surprised by the way that uh, certain the officers were committed to, to telling their own narratives about it and took real care. There was one of them uh, that lingered on the fact that Daniel Silva had this friend, had one friend um, 
who, who knew about, you know, what he was struggling with, and I thought, what, it was nowhere else in any of the other reports, but I thought, well, look at this police officer, he's using this, he has his own, he's, this is the, through the lens of his compassion for this person, you know, um, and it wasn't the kind of sterile, you know, just regurgitation of what happened, and so, um, those things were really compelling for me, and the act of storytelling itself, and how it has played a role in my life, and how, and what about, you know, you have to, these things happen to you, you have to keep telling the stories, because you go to the doctor, and there's a question on the, you know, survey, have you ever been in the hospital, and then, you know, even for the, you know, you go to see physicians, they themselves are really <laughs> stunned and really, you know, um, made vulnerable by your telling the story, and you're having to kind of tend to their own emotions by it, so, um, so telling my, my story is simply a way of, of making this my own, and um, but also allowing for the fact that there's so, for me writing the essay and incorporating the hospital records and the police reports is a way of also, you know, trying to accommodate all of these things. But but also to say that this is my story and those things happen, but they're not. I didn't assimilate that information into my telling. Um, so I don't know if that gets at the answer, but no, I, I and that I mean that. The, the sort of paradoxical piece of what you just said, that, that the storyteller is both, you're both, uh, the storytelling is a way of getting at the truth and trying to excavate the truth. And like, like Emily, I use police reports and documents and all that. And I, 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 your piece reminded me of some characters who've been kicking around in my head, some of these detectives who I hadn't thought of in a long mm -hmm. time, who were remarkable individuals. Mm -hmm. But you're also you're also making up lies at the same time because any story that is containable that is I'm sitting here in a room and I tell you okay let me just tell you what happened to me necessarily is omitting facts mm -hmm. necessarily is shaped to whatever the kind of political terrain we're on is 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 shaped to the emotional my emotional needs or your emotional needs mm -hmm. at the moment there's all kinds of lying that goes into storytelling, lying by omission or lying by commission. Um, having the, the balance of storytelling be the search for truth is the really hard, hard part and the one that I still feel really daunted by. Um, it's, it, it's interesting. Last question. Thank you. Um, so obviously as people who are professional storytellers, you're quite comfortable with sharing details with people publicly, whether it's through what you're writing or for a room full of strangers here. Um, but I'm curious, uh, after the incident, how readily in your personal relationships with people that you either met afterwards, I mean, obviously your friends and family, whether you wanted them to or not, found out the details. But for more distant acquaintances or people you met after that point, at what point do you if you do it all, to tell them this story? You know, it's uncomfortable, and I think, you know, you don't want to traumatize other people. You know, this is a, such a shocking and terrible thing. Um, and I was coming to do this event, and I had to cancel my classes, and my students said, what are you doing? And, you know, I said, I'm going to, to do this event, and they were asking, <laughs> you know, okay, you know, just don't be afraid, but this happened, this thing happened to me, and, you know, they're stunned into silence. and. Um, and you question your own motives, like, you know, do I do this, I, I don't want to shock people. Um, it, it doesn't always come up routinely, I mean, but it does come up in some, in some strange ways. The person I was saying earlier, people will say, how do you know each other? You know, often I just, I do say, well, we just from New Haven, or just yeah. from mutual friend, I'll just lie about it, because I don't want yeah. to, you know, yeah. ex expose him or me, yeah. you know, to have to, to, to tell, have to tell the story again, and then to shape it, because as I wrote here, I always tell people immediately, no one died. Because it's important, I think, for your listener to know, because then they feel a little safer. That, you know, this, I don't know if I want to hear the scary story. Um, I'll let you know. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, and the taking care of the listener part of it is an interesting thing. It's not, not a, from that point of view, not an easy story to tell. I, I have kind of an even odder relationship to this because since my full-time work now is talking to journalists about the work of covering violence and violent events and victims of violence and all that, I'm sort of constantly faced with the decision, do I, do I tell the story or not? Um, more often than not, I don't. Uh, there are a few people in this room who've known me for a long time who, until the word around this event came out, did, tonight's event, didn't know about it, didn't know about the stabbing. But that's, it's partly 
for the reasons that Emily just described, and partly also because you don't want to let an event like this just own you. You don't want to define your whole life by a single moment, and or at least I don't. I don't know about you, but I don't. And um, I started this essay, I started out writing this particular essay now so many years ago, motivated by my anger at having been made into a caricature and having my experience been made into a kind of bumper sticker for political beliefs I didn't hold. Well, I don't want to turn myself into my own bumper sticker. I don't, my own cliche. And that happens in inter, that can happen on the grand stage of, of, of you know, classrooms or political discourse. And it can happen in interpersonal relationships as well. So um, it's not that I find it so upsetting to talk about that causes me to be silent. It's a matter of, of self-definition and knowing that this is a, a big experience and a terrible one, but it's not the only experience that defines me. Um, I guess I'd leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for doing this, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, this has been an extraordinary event, um, so uh, please uh, show a little gratitude to our <laughs> families.